Australia, Attila Kanku, a family of practitioners of Mbala, uh, who is in charge of a medical and accident emergency, but a baby himself, and he becomes a medical expert. That's all right. Yeah. First of all, I receive no money from any tobacco, pharmaceutical or e-cigarette company. I just want to have a show of hands, if I can, of everyone who are vapors. Can you put up your hand? Okay, now what I want to do is everyone, now keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Now, if you use the majority of the time a e-cigarette that comes from a big tobacco company, I want you to keep your hand up. So, <laughs> two people. Two people out of all of those. Okay, that's great. I come from the land of Australia. Sorry, I come from Australia, where I'm a full-time clinical doctor, and it's the land of e-cigarette prohibition. And uh, they often try and make e-cigarettes synonymous with the tobacco industry. Did you know that in Australia, the possession of liquid, e-liquid, with nicotine in it for use in e-cigarettes? is punishable for, with the same penalties that apply to the possession of heroin. I first became interested in e-cigarettes when some of the most hardened smokers in my clinic started giving up by using them. I became fascinated by the idea of turning the whole quitting paradigm on its head. Instead of being about withdrawal and denial, it became something about excitement and enjoyment of something better. Who ever knew that quitting could be fun? <laughs> to my dismay, most people in tobacco control in Australia didn't share my excitement. In fact, they seemed disgusted and offended that people could enjoy recreational nicotine without the threat of death. They convinced the government to make nicotine illegal unless it's within tobacco or a pharmaceutical product. They're going according to the three P's of prohibition, puritanism and punishment. And it's my view that while this attitude holds, there is no hope for an end game in Australia. There are some that do have a different view in Australia, but they are very much in the minority and they are not as well connected politically. In every other field of drug use, we accept the ideas of harm minimisation and harm reduction, but somehow in Australia, nicotine and tobacco are seen as different. Look, I understand their concerns. They're worried about the entry of big tobacco into the market. They're worried about dual use, possibly sustaining smokers and people who might have quit otherwise. And of course, they're very worried about gateway effects on children. But policy needs to be based on evidence, not feelings, not concerns, and not worries. And so far, as the evidence comes in, it just gets stronger and stronger that the population effects they're so worried about are not happening. That the gateway is out, not into smoking. And their concerns take on more and more of a quality of magical thinking. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was already hijacked with this. I was so charged. <laughs> Someone already used this slide today. Anyway. So, the first magical thought is that the enemy is nicotine. But e-cigarettes are a plot from big tobacco to hook children on bubblegum flavoured vapour and then transition them to the cigarettes. We need a superhero to fight these evil corporations. Someone to stand up for the people, to stand up for the children. <laughs> but what if vaping is actually a genuine people's movement? Rejecting big tobacco, rejecting pharmaceutical companies, rejecting government control. This misled hero might find that he's actually just fighting ordinary people who can't quit smoking any other way. <laughs> True public health recognises the enemy is smoke. Three billion of the world's people 
rely on biomass fuel for their cooking and heating, like dung and wood, in small unventilated places. And the World Health Organization estimates that over 4 million deaths per year are attributable to this indoor pollution. It's not that different from the 6 million per year attributable to tobacco smoke. And they die from exactly the same causes, from heart attacks, from emphysema, from chronic bronchitis. There is nothing magical about tobacco smoke. It's the smoke. Imagine public health campaigning against gas stoves because we're just not sure that they're really safe to replace wood fires with gas stoves. We, we don't know the long-term outcomes of this. And interestingly, gas stoves have about 1% of the emissions as wood fires, just like vaping has about 1% of the emissions as smoking. So let's go back to Australia. We have some strange laws here. It's legal to import under federal law, but once you get your package of nicotine out of the letterbox, you're then committing a crime. And in some states, they're even banning the hardware. A Western Australian guy set up a small business selling second generation e-cigarettes, none from big tobacco, none with nicotine in them. One day, one morning, he woke up to a surreal scene, like out of a movie on busting Colombian drug cartels. Three black SUVs turned up at his home. Health department officials came out, forcibly confiscated his entire stock. They dragged him through the courts. They destroyed his business. They made him bankrupt. And there are health departments and cancer councils and other organisations in Australia right now calling for this to happen across the whole country. They want to ban even the hardware without nicotine. So the effects of prohibition in Australia, the main one is a very limited brick and mortar vape shops. You can get the hardware, but not the software. You just can't get that, that same help that you know, Richard Pelosa shows us how effective vape shops can be as, as basically quit smoking centres. You're not allowed to have that in Australia. You have to use the internet to vape. You have to be sophisticated enough to understand you know, YouTube and credit cards and all that. Um, and so many of the older smokers can't just... But what they want, they just want to go somewhere and get everything they need and get shown how to use it. That's not allowed in Australia. It's very much denormalised. And certainly there are vapors who will... Uh, they'll vape at home when they can. And when they go out on the street into town, they'll take they'll smoke again because it looks so different and so strange in Australia. Now, let's say the extreme prohibitionists win and they stop all imports into Australia, which some are calling for, of course. Now, they magically think that somehow nicotine isn't like every other drug. You know, every other drug, when you ban it, the toxicity goes up, the strength goes up. I tell you, it will happen 100 times more. Just imagine one mil of 100% nicotine in an ordinary envelope. Imagine thousands of these envelopes flooding Australia. There is no way that that could be stopped. In essence, what Australia is saying, that if you want to enjoy recreational nicotine, it's the death penalty for you. In the same way, because you can only use the most dangerous delivery device. In the same way that a ban on condoms would be a death penalty if you wanted to enjoy recreational sex in a place of high HIV prevalence. So surprisingly, we still have a significant amount of vapors in Australia, but it's about half the rate of other countries. I ask you, how long is it going to be before we see smoking rates in other countries go below Australia's. Now, we can see it already happening in one group, the most important group. Daily smoking in Australian teens has just stubbornly refused to go down for the last six years. Australia thinks they're so great at tobacco control, but in this in most important group, they really haven't done anything at all, despite all the plain packages, gory pictures, 
increased taxes. You know, it's really frustrating trying to compare this data because it's uh, very rare for people to report daily use rate data. Um, so I want to examine this um, Hawaii study where I actually did find some daily use data and it's really interesting. So let's say if I have a glass of wine once a month, am I an alcoholic? And in the same way, if a teenager takes a puff of an e-cigarette at a party, they are not a dependent vapor. Or if they take a puff on a smoke, they're not a dependent smoker. Now, this Hawaii study was reported in the media. It was part of the moral <coughs> panic series of, of reports. You know, 17% e-cigarette prevalence amongst youth. You know, 12% dual use. This is a catastrophe. We must take action now to ban these dangerous things. But, when we have a look at the daily data, vaping daily, the rate goes down to 2%. It's the same as the daily use of marijuana, 2%. Now, as a parent of teenagers, I tell you, I'd be just a little bit more worried if my teenager was getting stoned every day than if they were vaping every day, especially if they were vaping to get off cigarettes. So, in this population, with pretty high levels of e-cigarette experimentation, let's look at the most important figure, which is the daily smoking rates. Less than 1%. So compare that to 3.4% of Australia. Now, this isn't just one-off. We, um, it's, as I said, it's very hard to find data, but again, we get to Florida, and this combines middle school and high school data. 0.6 for middle school, 2.7 for high school. Combine that, sort of something like 1.6, 1.7% for the same, a pretty similar population range as Australia is reporting on. So half the rate of daily smoking as Australia. What I think is happening? Well, is that the easy availability of these cigarettes means that when children want to experiment with a smoking type of behaviour, they want to do something that's going to really piss their parents off, they're much more likely now to try an e-cigarette, often without nicotine. And they'll do this at a party here or there, but because we know that e-cigs, nicotine by itself, isn't anywhere near as addictive as with burnt and tobacco. It's, it's likely that we'll have a lot, even if we end up with a few regular vapors into the future, I think we're going to have lower rates than the overall smokers. And in certain, certainly, it, it looks to me to be a really powerful diversion away from smoking in the most important group. I mean, if something works to create less than 1%, less than 1%, this is endgame figures. This is how smoking ends. Not through prohibition, but the enjoyment of something better. Not through being controlled, but people taking the power back into their own hands to have recreational nicotine on the terms that you choose. This, our powerful revolution, is shaking the very foundations of the tobacco control establishment. One of these ordinary people, Lorian over there, she, a waitress from Cornwall, she was published in one of the most prestigious medical journals of the world. She struck such fear into the tobacco control establishment that no fewer than four professors from three different continents had to band together trembling to try to oppose her, to try to refute her, but they could not because she spoke the truth that they can save her life. They can save lives. And tobacco power production has the potential to save hundreds of millions of lives. Today I call on public health Talk to vapors, listen to them, understand them. And vapors, I ask of you a much harder thing. 
But if you can, you'll be tapping into the power that broke the British Empire in India. The power that destroyed institutional racism in America. And that is, be kind to public health and policy makers. <laughs> Especially those who might just be misled, and even your enemies. For by doing so, you'll be heaping burning coals of shame upon their heads. But they stood in the way of this revolution, and they caused more burning tobacco to be smoked. I have a dream, and it is happening now. <laughs> Public health and vapors together. We can, we must, and we will make smoking obsolete. Thank you.